It's perhaps one of the biggest mysteries in rock and roll, the disappearance of Manic Street Preacher's guitarist Richie Edwards. When we talk about the so-called 27 Club, Edwards is often not mentioned or forgotten, at least in North America. While some presumed he took his own life, no body was ever recovered, with some thinking his whole disappearance was possibly staged, or he had help. Today, let's take a look at the mysterious disappearance of Manic Street Preacher's guitarist Richie Edwards. Richie Edwards would be born in Blackwood, Wales in 1967. He would have one sibling, a sister named Rachel, with whom he was very close with. His sister would recall that from a young age, Richie was very imaginative, constructing detailed stories. It was when he became a teenager during the early 80s, he wrote stories about living abroad and falling off the grid. In fact, Edwards had several members of his family who did just that. Prior to joining the Manic Street Preachers, Richie was originally planning on being a teacher being a fan of political history, but life would have other plans. Richie would become friends with Nicky Wire, Sean Moore, and James Dean Bradfield at the Oakdale Comprehensive School. The boys minus Richie would form the group Manic Street Preachers, and since Richie wasn't proficient at playing an instrument, he instead helped the band out in their early days being a roadie and a driver. He would eventually become the group's guitarist, and while he may not have been the most technically proficient guitarist, he made up for it by becoming one of the band's principal songwriters along with bassist Nicky Wire. Formed in 1989, Manic Street Preachers found more in common with American bands than the burgeoning scene in the UK. Guitarist Richie Edwards would tell an interviewer about the band's origins. We started at a time when rock and roll was dead. The UK was in the grip of dance, rap, and the acid house thing. All the Manchester sound stuff sounded so contrived. The only rock and roll was coming out of America. We were consciously reacting against all that. Our friends laughed at us because they said there was no audience for us, but we felt we had to do something to bring back rock and roll, so that's how Manic Street Preachers came about. The group combined hard rock with elements of punk, and the band's lyrics would provide blistering commentaries on politics, sex, and pop culture. Hailing from South Wales, the musicians who made up Manic Street Preachers had witnessed the unrest in their hometown seeing minor strikes. Much like the Rust Belt in America, good paying middle income jobs were disappearing and miners soon had to transition to new jobs. In fact, Richie's father Graham, who worked as a miner, soon became a hairdresser. Bassist Nicky Wire explained to The Independent in 1996, Our romance is based on where we came from and the desire to escape and grew up with the feeling that the Welsh had been held down in Britain, he would say. Escaping was always on the band's mind, even Richie's. The Independent newspaper would publish an article in 1996 describing their interactions with Richie saying, Talking to him was like chatting with a mini rain man. He could be describing in minute and obscure detail the corruption of Winston Churchill, only to become distraught at the prospect of missing his favorite television soap opera. At 3 a.m. watching lousy late night television, blind drunk and chain smoking, he could convincingly articulate an argument for the return of Soviet communism. In both his lyrics and interviews, Richie was pretty open about his mental health struggles. Perhaps nothing more was a better example than the 1991 interview he did with New Musical Express writer Steve Lamack after a gig where he carved the words for real in his arm. The band's first LP would be 1992's Generation Terrorists, followed by 1993's Gold Against the Soul, and their final album with Edwards, 1994's The Holy Bible. The band's label had hoped that The Holy Bible would be their big breakout in America, place where the band initially struggled to make inroads. Despite the group's growing fame, Edwards' mental health only seemed to get worse. He was known for being a chronic insomniac and used vodka to help him sleep. It was in the summer of 1994 he'd spent several months in a hospital for self-harm, alcohol abuse, and an eating disorder. At the time, the band claimed he was suffering from an, I quote, nervous exhaustion. It was during Edwards' stint in the facility he was visited by his bandmates, who told him that he could leave the band or just sit on the sidelines and write lyrics but not tour. At first, according to The Independent, Edwards agreed, but a few hours later, he called his bandmates frantically, begging not to be thrown out of the group. It was during Edwards' stay in the hospital that the band released their third LP, The Holy Bible, and the album offered some insight into Edwards' frame of mind at the time. It was following his stint in rehab, he immediately hit the road with the band, touring across Europe, and despite the fact that he stopped using alcohol on tour, he couldn't sleep and had likely contributed to his erratic behavior on the road. His final concert with the band would take place on December 21st, 1994 at the London Astoria and he would give his final interview on January 23rd, 1995 to a Japanese publication named Music Life. To help increase the band's awareness across the pond, it was planned that Edwards and Bradfield would fly to America on February 1st, 1995. 
But Edwards never made the flight. In fact, he spoke to his mother a few weeks prior and expressed how he didn't want to go to the States, but his parents didn't think anything seemed out of the ordinary. The night before their trip, Edwards and Bradfield were staying at the Embassy Hotel in London. Once Edwards checked into his room, he took out a box of books and videos from his bag. He would place them with a note that read, I love you, along with a collage and literary quotations. The package was supposedly for his on-again, off-again girlfriend, Joe, with whom he had split with a few weeks prior. It was the same day that Bradfield and Edwards would spend some time listening to some demos the band had recorded in the basement of the hotel. The plan was for the pair to go out in the evening and explore the local restaurants and bars, but when Bradfield knocked on Edward's door later that evening, the guitarist said he changed his mind and wanted a quiet evening to himself. The next morning on February 1st, 1995, Bradfield went to get Richie from his room, but got no response. Upon getting access to his room a little bit later, Richie was not found, but 30 pages of lyrics for Bradfield to write music to were found according to the Independent. The police came up with a timeline that at 7 a.m. on February 1st, 1995, Edwards took his wallet, his passport, car keys, and some of his antidepressants Prozac and checked out of his hotel. It's said that he drove to his apartment in Cardiff where he left behind his medication, passport, and a toll booth receipt that was stamped at 255. The following day, the band's manager informed the police that Richie was missing, and his family would place advertisements in the local paper that read, Richie, please make contact. Love mom, dad, and Rachel. The advertisement would run for three days. A few weeks before he officially went missing, the guitarist withdrew 200 pounds a day, which amounted to about 3,000 pounds. It wasn't clear what the money was for. It was thought for a while that Bradfield was the last person to see Edwards, but a book about Edwards released in 2019 titled Withdrawn Traces, Searching for the Truth About Richie Manic, the book claimed a woman named Vivian was the last person to see the guitarist. She had visited him in his hotel room, with Edwards' sister revealing to Wales Online. Apparently the night before, Richie was trying to give Vivian his passport saying, I won't be needing this anymore. The day before his disappearance, Edwards also gave his friend, a woman named Emma Forrest, a book called Novel with Cocaine, telling her to read the introduction, which details the author staying at a mental institution before disappearing, bearing an eerie resemblance to Edwards' circumstances. In the days after his official disappearance, there were reported sightings of the guitarist, but those who claimed to have seen him didn't know he was declared missing at the time. Edwards was reportedly spotted in the Newport Passport Office and at a bus station by a fan who supposedly chatted with him about a common friend. A Newport cab driver claimed to have driven a man they thought was Edwards on February 7th, picking him up from the King Hotel and driving him through South Wales. The cab driver claimed the man initially had a Cockney accent, which sounded fake, and then went into a Welch accent. The man also asked if he could lay down in the back of the cab and requested the cab driver to take the back roads rather than main roads. They would eventually reach the Blackwood bus station, but the passenger told the cab driver, and I quote, this is not the place, and asked to be taken to the Pawneepool railway station. He would eventually get out at the Severn View service station and paid nearly 70 pounds in cab fare. It's been said that the police botched the whole investigation, not interviewing key witnesses who were around the guitarist prior to disappearance, and didn't take into account Edward's mental state. In addition to that, Richie's sister claimed the police were slow to review CCTV footage. And finally, on February 17, 1995, Richie's car, a Vauxhall Cavalier, was found abandoned at a gas station about half a mile from the Severn Bridge. The police, upon searching the vehicle, found there was evidence that the car was being lived in and found what appeared to be a recent photo of Edward's family. The police also noticed that the car's battery was dead. The location of where the car was found raised a lot of suspicion as to what could have happened to Edwards. The Severn Bridge was unfortunately a popular spot for people to jump and take their own lives. One hypothesis was that Edwards jumped from the bridge. No body was ever found, but the currents of the channel are extremely strong and some of the bodies of the people who have jumped have never been found. The police would admit that Edwards' body may have been carried out to sea. A pair of human feet were found downstream from the bridge but DNA testing proved conclusively that they didn't belong to Richie. However, those close to Edwards claimed that it was unlikely he took his own life, as he talked about the issue and why he would never do that, telling an interviewer, In terms of the S-word, that does not enter my mind, and it never has done. In terms of attempt, because I am stronger than that. I might be a weak person, but I can take pain, he would say. The month after his disappearance, there were reports that Edwards placed phone calls to friends, and in the years since his disappearance, He's allegedly been seen in various locations around the world, including Liverpool, New York City, Germany, Israel, and even as far as India. According to Edward's sister, the guitarist was obsessed with the idea of disappearing from a young age. He had been a fan of author J.D. Salinger, who famously wrote Catcher in the Rye, and who himself was a recluse. 
On June 1st, 1995, the police officially called off their search for Edwards, putting out a statement according to MTV that read, We are not investigating anymore, and Mr. Edwards is no nearer to being found. He's over 18, so he's entitled to go missing. We have no reason to believe he's taken his own life. The police claim they received more than 100 pieces of information regarding Edwards, although none proved to be strong or positive leads, adding, We are still receiving two or three calls a week, but a lot of them are crank calls. If anybody does provide a definite lead, we will follow it up but at the moment there's nothing. The police would add that since his disappearance, Edward's bank account hadn't seen any activity. In March of 1997, a person named Vivian Morris, a media studies teacher from South Wales, would tell a Welsh paper that they spotted Edwards in Goa, India during a vacation. They would recall, I was sitting having a coke and I thought to myself, I know that guy. He was a little worse for wear. His hair was a lot longer, but he looked quite well and had quite a suntan. I asked a bloke who was sitting nearby and he said, that's Rick. He said he had come over to Goa about 18 months earlier. Edward's sister would claim that she had heard from other people too that they had spotted her brother in India, but nothing seemed to come out of those leads. Then in December of 1998, Edward's parents would fly to the Spanish island of Fuerteventura after reports surfaced of a man fitting their son's description, being seen at a bar called the Underground, but sadly the report amounted to nothing. Even though the families had the opportunity to declare Richie dead in 2002, they opted not to. On November 24, 2008, Richie's family declared him legally dead. In the years that followed, there's been new evidence about Edward's disappearance that have come to light. The book I had previously mentioned, Withdrawn Traces, would see cooperation from his sister Sarah. When one of the authors went for a haircut, the hairdresser supposedly brought up Edward's, with his sister recalling, the lady cutting his hair said, he's actually been living in a kibbutz in Israel, everybody knows. As you can imagine, it took him aback. Edwards, prior to his disappearance, had previously talked about visiting Israel and even befriended a woman in the summer of 1994 when he was in the hospital. That woman would end up later moving to Israel. The book also had one theory that Edwards suffered from Asperger's syndrome, which of course was undiagnosed. That may have led him to cutting off contact from his friends and family. In fact, like I mentioned earlier, Two family members of Edwards had done similar things. The book would also go on to insinuate that Richie's entire disappearance was planned. Another piece of evidence that the book highlighted was the time that Richie crossed the bridge, throwing off the police entire timeline of the disappearance. It was originally thought the toll booth receipt was stamped at 2.55 p.m., when in actuality the clock was a 24-hour clock and was actually stamped at 2.55 in the morning. It was following Edward's death that his bandmates continued, at least up until 2005, to deposit 25% of their income into Richie's bank account in case he ever came back. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. We'll see you again in Rock and Stories. Take care.